Hey everybody, it's great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study where we are walking through the Bible in a year. Today is March 25th and we are studying the life of Joshua and the conquests of the Israelites under his leadership. I love the reading today. Of course, I love all the readings, but today is the story when the sun stood still. And if you had never heard of this story before, it is in the reading today in Joshua chapter uh, 10, 9 and 10, and actually it's in 10, yeah. And, you know, I, I think scientists have actually corroborated that this was a true story that this really happened. Of course, I, I don't have any doubt that it didn't happen and did some digging today, which I'd like to share with you about what actually could have happened. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We are studying Joshua and, you know, he is a great example of a military strategist that not only uses cunning and skill, but of course he is very dependent on the Lord. Doesn't take a step without without really inquiring of the Lord and finding out what it is God wants him to do. That is a role model for all of us. And that, that's just one of the many reasons I love studying the life of Joshua. I, I wonder if you do too. Why would Joshua defend the Gibeonites today after the trick they played? Do you remember the trick that they played? See, when the, the Israelites is this horde of people, millions of people, and their word is spreading very quickly. They've defeated um, Jericho. I is behind them, the Battle of I. God has told them to come in and take this land. So they have multiple cities multiple battles ahead of them. This is not just a one week kind of a conquest. This is this is a long time. And the kings and the people in the towns are hearing about uh, this this people and they naturally are thinking well they're going to come and take our land which is actually what's going to happen. And the Gibeonites were a people that um, you recall, tricked Joshua into thinking that they were somebody that they weren't, and Joshua makes a peace treaty with them, and ultimately uh, it turns out to be one of the groups that God had wanted to be destroyed. However, they end up becoming slaves, and I think it said in our reading a couple days ago that this the Gibeonites um, were, were uh, slaves of the um, Israelites for, for a very, very long time. These Gibeonites are the people that Israel is coming in to protect because they have sent the word to Joshua that these five kings have come together from five towns and are attacking. And Joshua, in his wisdom, sees that this might be an opportunity if, if, he, can, if he can get this, if he can win this battle then this would be the strategic break that he was looking for. You know, God told him to go take the land, but he, of course it's with God's help, but he had to apply his wisdom and knowledge to develop a plan on how this would, this would uh, take place. It just made sense to Joshua that this whole thing would move quicker if he could take five cities out at once instead of going one city at a time makes a lot of sense. God answered Joshua not to be afraid of these five kings and the, their armies. Now, we see a victory here in Joshua 10:12. I'll call it Beth Haran, and God actually sent hail down from heaven to help with this victory. So it's in the midst of this win that Joshua is asking God, please, I need a little bit more daylight. You see, it wasn't nighttime when he asked this. It was about noon, from what I understand. It was about noon when he asked this. And think about the amount of faith that it took to ask God, please, God in heaven, he must have believed that he could do it, make the moon stand still and make the sun stand still just a little longer so that I can win this battle because we need daylight to do it. So number one, it was a strategic victory. Number two, Joshua knew it was very important. It would move things along. Number three, he applied faith in the situation. And number four, he asked God to participate in what he was facing and do something that only God can do. 
You know, sometimes I wonder if our prayers bore God. Because God is the God who made the sea and the sea creatures and the fish and the mountains. And he's the one that brings us sunrises every morning and sunsets every evening. Sometimes I wonder if some of the things we ask God are just too easy for him. Well, here was something that I bet looked like a pretty God-sized challenge. And God answered Joshua's prayer. So... As Joshua was thinking ahead, Lord, I need more time, God meets him at that point, and God let the sun and the moon stand still. What faith, but what a mighty God we serve. So let's talk about how God could have, could have done this, could have made this happen. We know today, with all of our scientific knowledge, that the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. It's the earth that revolves around the sun. So when we read that the sun stood still, uh, that's just kind of a play on words because the sun always stands still. It's the earth that's moving around the sun. So in one, in one study that I read, it said that God probably slowed the rotation of the earth and doubled it because now the rotation of the earth is it makes one rotation every 24 hours well the speculation is that God could have slowed the movement of the earth to be 48 hours one rotation and that would have made it look like and seem like the sun and the moon was standing still just a possibility of how God um, would have done that now in the um, in my Bible, it says this event is recorded in the book of Jashar. And the book of Jashar is a book that I've, I've never read. I'd love to know more about it. What I found out about it is that it's a Hebrew literary collection of songs written in poetic style to honor the accomplishments of Israel's leaders. I wonder if it's even, you know, published. I wonder if there is even a copy of it yet today. You know, some, some writings are lost over time, but uh, I'm, I'm wondering about that one since it's in the Bible, the book of Jashar. It would be an interesting book to read. So if you know anything about this, put it on the blog today. I would love to, um, to find out more. Why do you suppose the sun and the moon was significant? Do you suppose it had any significance at all? Actually, yes. The sun and the moon were things created things that were worshipped by the Canaanites. So here again, God was communicating to the Canaanites through the sun and the moon by saying, you know, I am the one true God. I am even greater than the sun and the moon. And, uh, you know, it makes you wonder if they got, got that message. Now, we've been talking about Joshua being a military genius and a spiritual giant. And his tactics are skillful, and his battles are offensive. And that's, that's something to, to watch as we continue to read about his victories. In Joshua 11.4, it says that all the kings, these five kings, came out to fight. Their combined armies formed a vast horde. That's what it says in, in our Bible. Do you know how vast this vast horde really was? Josephus was a historian, and a lot of times scholars look to his writings to fill in the blanks. He has written about this battle, and in his writings he said that there were 300,000 soldiers, 300,000 soldiers, and 20,000 chariots, chariots with horses that would have been coming against Joshua and his, uh, his band of men. That is a huge battle. So just kind of put yourself in the position. This, this was no easy feat for Joshua to do what he's doing. And he was relying on God the whole way. Then it says... I love it in the Bible. After, after this, you got 300,000 people, 20,000 horses and chariots. Then God spoke. What did he say? Do not be afraid. I love it when God shows up just at the moment when we need him to, to reassure us. Here he's reassuring Joshua. Do not be afraid. God gives him the command to destroy the horses and the chariots. Why in the world would that be necessary? How could a horse hurt them later on. Why did they need to be destroyed? 
Well, you see, the Canaanites used horses in their pagan rituals. And later we're going to see that the Israelites actually, much later, start to participate in those practices. But that's later. Today, it's a command that God gave to Joshua that made no sense, but he did it anyway. Doesn't God oftentimes tell us to do things that to us it just makes no sense in the moment? But we have to remember in that time that it's, it's better to trust without seeing than it is to have all of the information and let it make rational sense in our human minds. So many times we won't walk with God if it doesn't make sense to us. But here's a picture of Joshua who is listening to God and doing as he said. He's letting God be God. And he is realizing that he doesn't have to know all the details. And he doesn't have to know and see all the puzzle pieces and to see how they fit together because he knows that someone else knows and that that is his God. That's the same for you and me. So in Psalm 20, verse 7, I love it how that references uh, not, um, not trusting in the horses and the chariots and the, the things that we can feel and touch in our life because God is the one that ultimately in whom our trust should reside. So we have a decisive victory here that's been won, and the key to victory was what? Obeying the Lord. And I love how it says in our, in our reading today that Joshua took control of these five cities, and he did it just as God had commanded. And that is what we want to try to apply to our life today. Can it be said of your life, can it be said of mine, that we have taken the victory just as God has commanded? That's my prayer for you today, that you would clearly hear his voice and take courage so that you can obey. Well, I hope that this has been a blessing to you. It's been my privilege and honor to Bible study with you today. Until tomorrow, shalom.